Hey everyone, welcome back to the Fantasy Bros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester, joined as always by Mike Taglier. You can find us on Twitter at Mike Taglier NFL and at Bobby Fantasy Pro. How's your week going, Tags? It's going fantastic, dude. I, I, I came across the draft countdown tool on NFL's website uh, today, and it said 15 days, and it was counting down the, the minutes, the seconds, the hours, all that stuff, and uh, it got me excited. And then, and then the, of course, the preseason schedule was released, and we now know that the Bears are going to be playing the Hall of Fame game, uh, the first game of the season. So I'm, I'm pretty psyched, man. I, I, football is in the air, even though we have, you know, what, five months until basically the season opener. It's still it's, – it's a wonderful time for an NFL Says fan. the guy who came on the baseball podcast – Oh man, that was uh, that was a bad time. I mean, like that's the thing is like I, someone asked me like, Mike, did you really do this or is is it is it just the Fantasy Pros account trolling us? And I was like, no. I, despite my better judgment, I did hop on and talk some baseball with Bobby. <laughs> anyway, this episode is brought to you by RX Bar. For twenty five percent off your first offer, visit rxbar.com slash fantasy pros and enter the promo code fantasy pros at checkout. We're joined today by Michael Moore of Pro Football Focus. Michael hosts the Dynasty Slant podcast, which is perfect because we're going to be talking about Dynasty stocks today. You can follow him on Twitter at PFF underscore more. How's it going? Good. How are you guys? Doing great, man. It's cold. I, I, we were talking before this. You said you live in Texas. I want to come down and join you. Thanks for coming on the show today, Michael. I was going to say, it's like 80 degrees, and I'm not going <laughs> to lie. It's very nice outside. Now, having said that, it will be 100 like shortly. So, and it will be that way for like four months. So we have like a very narrow window where it's actually livable and enjoyable. So I take a hundred degrees, man. I'm sitting down here recording this podcast in a bathrobe. Mm. Well, I mean, look, that's living the dream though, isn't it? I like to do that. I can't, I have regular clothes on, but <laughs> I'm wearing regular clothes too. That's the thing is like, you know, I can wear a coat and stuff. That's not warm enough. I got to wear a bathrobe too. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah. Look, I've got an extra room, man. So if you ever need a place to stay, you let me know. I'm taking you up on that. The next time it gets cold, I'm headed down there. <laughs> well, this right. is weird. This is weird already. I feel like I have uh, two girlfriends in the room and uh, they're both talking, talking about moving in with each other because, Bobby, I don't know if you know, <laughs> but I used to, more used to be the host on the PFF podcast when I was on there. And now you're the host for me on the Fantasy Pros podcast. So it's like two hosts talking to each other and you guys are my favorite. Like, that's why we had more on. Like, I'm, I'm looking forward to this episode, but it's weird talking about you guys moving in together. I was going to say, Mike, too. I feel like you're cheating on me. That's what I felt like. But, I'm, you know, I'm going to get over it, I guess. I don't have a choice. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> man. On, so. so, guys, today I made a really big mistake. I used to love Jack in the Box tacos when I was in college. Then I started to come down with mono, and we had a taco eating contest that night. I felt <laughs> so sick. I seriously didn't eat Jack in the Box tacos for seven or eight years. I really never eat fast food. Guys, it was so nasty. I didn't even finish it. I went home and ate hummus for lunch. I don't know what is happening to me. Wait, what? You, you don't like Jack in the Box tacos? So hold on a second. So I, I'm obviously back out in Chicago, and we don't have Jack in the Box here. So when I was out in Arizona, it became like a staple. Like it was one of those things where it was like Jack in the Box tacos are legit. They're not good for you, but they're legit. No. No, they changed my mind completely today. I was thinking, like, why have I not been eating these for seven or eight years? Like, I'm, I'm sure I'm over it now. No, they're just nasty now, man. And look, uh, I don't blame you, Bobby, because don't get me wrong. Jack in the Box tacos are great. For me personally, if I need a taco, I'm probably going to Taco Bell, which I know I'm in the minority on that. But Taco Bell, that's where it's at. Now, Jack in the Box, you got to get the ultimate bacon cheeseburger. So that was your first mistake. You got to get the <laughs> taco when you go to Jack in the Box. As I mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking Dynasty stocks today. And we're going to go that, back to that roundtable fashion that we've been doing, each giving a few players at each position that we're buying and selling in Dynasty Leagues. Guys, let's start at running back today, and we'll let you go first here, Michael. Who is your number one running back buy in Dynasty Leagues? You know, and, and again, no offense, Mike. Don't be offended when I bring up my current <laughs> podcast partner, Scott Spratt, over at PFF. But uh, me and him <laughs> are big on the Alex Collins train uh, over in Baltimore. Um, you know, not many people were expecting a lot last year. Obviously filled in for Baltimore when they uh, had a couple guys go down due to injury, uh, most notably Kenneth Dixon. So, uh, and he performed very well. I mean, he had like a 4.7, 4.9 yards per carry. Um, he was actually a, a top 15 fantasy back for the whole season. So, and yet I don't see a lot of talk about him this offseason, and especially after the Ravens didn't bring in anyone competition-wise. Now, it's before the draft, so don't get me wrong. It's very possible they bring someone in that way. But, look, there were a lot of backs out there that they could have brought in and they didn't. So, to me, that tells me that they uh, are a believer. 
Tags, I know you want to hop in right now. And I, I love your analysis. I, I like you to go right after the expert that joins the show because <laughs> I, I always want to comment on what you're going to say. But I'm jumping in here because I actually have Collins as one of my cells here. Um, I get it. I mean, the Ravens, they, they need a wide receiver, but they really need offensive line help too. And Collins was very good behind that. But I just feel like he's one of these guys that every single year we see these guys pop up. Zach Stacy, you remember him? And he was the guy, just like Collins, that you know you, you buy him in Dynasty Leagues. And I think that uh, a lot of people are thinking this about Collins right now. He's really good. He's going to get more opportunity this year. So I think you can get a bigger price. I'm not saying Collins is worthless. I just think you can sell him for a pretty good price right now. So my question to you guys here, like, no, Bobby, you didn't mention his name. So I'm guessing that's not factoring into it. Uh, but Kenneth Dixon, did we forget about him? Because like before last off season, we, we heard a lot about Harbaugh not giving up on Dixon, saying that he's still part of their plans long-term. And obviously, you know, the injury, <laughs> that set things back but they did re-sign Collins it didn't seem to be a priority like it wasn't the first signing that they did in free agency they didn't get it done before free agency started so more are you worried at all about Kenneth Dixon because obviously he was a high draft pick for them just a couple of years ago not really um I really want to see Dixon I guess stay on the field for an yeah. extended mm -hmm. amount of time <laughs> you know and then even back to the draft um in looking at what Ozzie Newsom's done in the draft since he's been a general manager and I looked this up, so you know it's true. He's only drafted three running backs in the top three rounds. And he's been a GM for 15, 16 years. So, um, I, you know, don't get me wrong. Is it possible they bring in a back in the draft? Sure. And, look, there's a lot of good backs in this draft, no doubt. But I don't know. To me, I think Collins earned at least the starting job going in, and I think he'll hold on to it. Here's the thing. Even if Collins messes up, they're not just going to flat out give the job to Dixon. He's got to prove himself. Like we're hoping Dixon can become Alex Collins someday, right? Maybe. I mean, there was, there was so many, there were some flashes in the preseason. And then even when they got to the regular season, he played well in certain spurts when he wasn't hurting because obviously his knee injury affected him a little bit. Dixon was someone who was supposed to be like a grinder, like a yards after contact, kind of like an Alex Collins actually, where I would actually think that they expected him to be a better receiver than Collins. But the fact that they did re-sign Collins, it did move Dixon down my board, but I still think he's like lingering in the background is someone I think people may have forgotten about, but it, by looking at it more, a lot of the experts are with you because Alex Collins ECR right now in dynasty is at 24 where his ADP in dynasty startup drafts is 32, the 30, 30, 32nd running back off the board. So experts obviously agree with you on this one where they think Collins is going to be an RB two or he should be looked at as an RB two in dynasty formats. I think he's being drafted too low. Like I, it sounds like, you know, I'm agreeing with Michael here. <laughs> the thing is it's from people I've been talking to, there's somebody in every league who's, gaga over alex collins right now i'd like to have alex collins i would draft him in a dynasty startup draft with that being said i just think you can sell him for more but tags i'm, I'm hearing about kenneth dixon from you but what do you think about collins like is he a good running back or not? I think he's solid. He played really well in a bad offense last year. So, I, I mean, he, he was someone that I was really slow to come around on last year because I didn't want to believe on him. I'm like, you want running backs that are in good offenses. The Baltimore offensive line didn't seem like they were going to be very good. Marshall Yonda, their starting Pro Bowl guard, uh, went down early in the season. So it was like, oh, I don't want any part of this. And then, you know, Buck Allen was producing. And, but Alex Collins, like, got better. And he, like, forced the Ravens to give him more touches as the season went on. So I, I started to believe in him more and more. The offseason, I was really hoping that they would sign him before free agency started because it would have gave me a little more confidence in him. But the fact that they did re-sign him at all, I believe he has a, a stranglehold on the starting job. But I still worry that it's going to be somewhat of a timeshare between mixing in Buck Allen, mixing in Kenneth Dixon. Uh, and if they do draft a running back, I would imagine it's going to be like a Danny Woodhead replacement where it's just like a, a guy that they can have contribute on third downs. Yeah. Tags, who's your number one buy? Don't take my guy. I know that you're going to. It's probably, I mean, I don't know if, if other people view him as a buy right now, but uh, for me, it's Joe Mixon. Joe Mixon w was someone like last year where people were talking about Leonard Fournette and Joe Mixon, like, which one do you take at the top of your drafts? And some people said it was Mixon because of what he can contribute on third down. And I still kind of stand by that. Like, I think Fournette's a special talent, and I was drafting Fournette over him. But the people that told me that they were going to take Mixon, I, I literally had no issue with it, especially if they were in, like, a PPR format. Because we knew that Jeremy Hill wasn't special. We knew that Gio Bernard is just a timeshare running back, one that is, is more of, like, that 8-10 to 10 touch running back. But last year, so many people got down on Mixon because of the circumstances. We talked about it, Bobby, before the season even started. I know you and Jake Seeley, we got into this big three-way debate and I was saying, don't draft Joe Mixon in redraft. Like in Dynasty, you're going to be able to buy him low because he's going to start lower on the depth chart. They're going to have a timeshare. But the fact that they like they legitimately said, Jeremy Hill, you're done. You're gone. Like we're not even going to negotiate with you. Gio Bernard, we know who he is. There's nobody else in this depth chart. 
Yeah, he but often, Marvin Lewis loves Joe Bernard. You can't leave that part out. Well, that's the thing. <laughs> well, that I, they would not have drafted Joe Mixon if he loved him that much. That's my issue there. Obviously, they drafted Jeremy Hill after Gio Bernard was already there. Then they drafted Mixon. I think they realized that Gio was not meant to carry a big workload. And on top of that, now Cincinnati, that you know, they went out and they traded for Cordy Glenn. Great. They got the left tackle position solidified. They have, you know, two of the top, I want to say, top 45 picks in the draft. I anticipate them going offensive linemen with at least a minimum of one of them. There's a lot of good centers there. There's a lot of good guards on the board. So I do, I mean, if Connor Williams falls to them at, uh, with the pick they got from the Bills, it was either 21 or 22. I can't remember right off the top of my head. If, they, if Connor Williams falls there and they get him at right tackle, their offensive line is slowly being rebuilt. I do believe that there's going to be a new coach in town relatively soon. But still, even last year, when you go down, when, when Jeremy Hill went down, Joe Mixon was started in fantasy as an RB1 almost every single week. They were giving him 18, 20 touches a game. So Mixon is a complete running back. That's what I look for in PPR formats. That's what I look for in Dynasty because – You'll see as we go through the buys and sells here is that I want to buy three down backs. I want to get rid of those that are that are kind of like specialist or one, two down backs. Yeah, I like Mix. And Michael, how do you feel about him? Uh, I like him. I guess my question, Mike, for you is where where is he now that you are buying him? Does that make sense? Like, like is he, he's a value now. So where is he for you that he's being under undervalued? I want I I truly like me I believe that he should be in the conversation with those like Kareem Hunt, Delvin Cook. That's where Ooh. I believe that Mixon belongs in that tier. Like I don't know if you'd put I him ahead. I don't think you'd put him ahead of Kareem Hunt because of the offense that Hunt plays in. There's a lot to love there. Delvin Cook, we saw a little bit of a sample size. Latavius Murray obviously played very well. They may share duties more than people think uh, cuz I don't think Latavius Murray is just going to go away. I would rather have Mixon like than someone like Christian McCaffrey or Devonta Freeman. Those guys are in timeshares. They're not three down. They're not I mean, Devonta Freeman's a three down back. I love Devonta Freeman, but he, Tevin Coleman's not going anywhere. Let's be realistic about this. So um, Joe Mixon to me is a top 10 dynasty running back. There's a lot of players that uh, it seems that the community is higher on. Like, you know, I, I mentioned a few of those names. I think that Jordan Howard is someone that I would deal a se- in a second. Like if you have Jordan Howard and you can get Joe Mixon, I would make that deal in a heartbeat. Okay. I've got Joe Mixon there as well. I mean, we talked about it last episode, man. Um, it seems like they're committed to making him a workhorse, maybe even a three down back. He's got that kind of upside and talent. Uh, he looked really good at times last year. We saw him carry the ball 20 plus times a few times. And I agree. I mean, Dalvin Cook coming off the big injury and Jordan Howard about to get traded. Maybe we'll see what happens there. Uh, there's a lot of question marks about all those guys. I don't really see any question marks about Mixon. Yeah. And I'd agree with all that, Mike. I think, uh, with Mixon, I, the only thing I want to see more of, I guess, is Cincinnati run a little more. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were in like the lower third of rush attempts last year and, and only ran it 24 times a game. Now, with Hill out of the way, obviously, that will sort of um, uh, make up for some of that. And you're absolutely right about the offensive line. According to our PFF graders, they had, I think, the 26th best run blocking unit uh, as far as the offensive line goes. So anything they can do. Uh, to improve that, which they can literally only go up from there, uh, I think will help Mixon. So, yeah, I, and I'd agree with all that. And let's not forget, the guy's 21. He'll be 22 this season. So I mean, young. that's still younger than yeah. a couple of the rookies coming in. So, um, yeah, I'd agree with all that, Mike. I think it's a, a lower uh, – well, lower single digits as far as rankings go. That makes nice. Sense. So we mentioned Jordan Howard and how uh, there's rumors that he may be traded after the draft. You know, I know there's a lot of running backs in the draft that the Bears could go out and get, but Matt Nagy's sitting there, and he's got like a mini Kareem Hunt in his hands. Uh, you talked about him last the last couple shows here, Tags, and I went back and I watched the tape on Tariq Cohen. Man, there's a reason they call him the human joystick. Yeah. It is incredible. I can't wait to see what Matt Nagy's going to do with him. I, I really think he's going to have like an Alvin Kamara role, and he could be a monster in fantasy leagues. Yeah, Tariq Cohen, I mean, that's the thing. That's what I worry about with Jordan Howard is that, you know, I think a lot of people overestimate the the inability to catch passes out of the backfield. Like, you know, a lot of people talked about uh, Leonard Fournette and how he wasn't a receiver. I think he proved in 2017 that he's at least competent, right? Uh, you're not. He's not going to be a guy like Alvin Kamara that's going to make these flashes. He's going to make one-arm grabs. He's not going to save your quarterback, but he's competent, right? I mean, but Jordan Howard legitimately is awful when it comes to catching <laughs> passes like no no it, like it, it's beyond bad like and that's the thing I'm usually pretty forgiving with these things it's like ah, eh, there's gonna be one or two plays per game where you're actually gonna ask him to catch a pass 
No, in 2016, there was a there was a game where he dropped five balls. I went back to 2008, and I couldn't find another running back that did that. Then you go into 2017, and he looked just as bad. Like, people were saying it was his eyes. He had eye surgery, and he got it fixed. He never got it fixed, and he looked just as bad. And, you know, Jordan Howard himself admitted after John Fox was fired, he came out and said, you know, teams knew what we were doing. You know, I was on the field. We were running the ball. You know, um, Tariq Cohen was on the field. We were most likely going to be in some sort of passing situation. And it was a joke as the year went on. Matt Nagy is going to get them both in the field if he doesn't trade Howard. But here's the thing. I know I'm jumping ahead here, but I have Jordan Howard as like one of the best sells in dynasty football. Like, yeah, he's, I consider him there. Yeah, right now he's being, he lo- he's being looked at as the 13th best running back uh, in is a dynasty. I, I don't see Too risky. it. He, he's a one-two down back. Why is he better than Derrick Henry? Huh, well, because Derrick, they didn't go out and sign like a, a starting running back uh, like Deion Lewis. I think there's a big difference between Well, those. could Tariq Cohen not be somewhat like Deion Lewis? But Derrick Henry's more talented than Jordan Howard. Uh, can we agree on that? Oh, yeah. It's not even close. I'd agree with that talent-wise, but I think I'm going to agree with Bobby on this one, at least when it comes to Henry. They signed Deion Lewis. That that is that completely took the wind out of those sales for me. Because, well, and I'll get to that because, you know, spoiler alert, he's one of my sales. But I'll let you finish, Mike, and then we can go to that. No, no, no. That, that's I mean, that's the thing. I actually would sell Derrick Henry, too, if you can get, like, a King's Ransom for him. Because I know there's some people that believe that he's the guy and that Deion Lewis was just a depth ad. I'm just comparing the two. Like, I think Henry's a sell, and that's why I also think that Jordan Howard is a sell. Because I, I view them both in a similar situation. I just think that Derrick Henry is a more talented running back. I, what, are you, I just, what are you going to get for Henry, though? Like, who is still convinced that he's the starting running back? Oh, I've seen people getting first-round picks for him. Oh, like, that's crazy. Really? I want to play in those leagues. That's, Actually, I don't because I don't think it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I mean, just to sort of uh, piggyback on that with Howard. And, look, it, 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 whether we're aware of it or not or, or people know, Matt Nagy loves his backs to catch passes. He just does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if your running back cannot do that, he's going to find someone else. That's just how it is. And that's why Tariq Cohen, like you guys said, is such a hot commodity. And with Howard, you know, he had this great rookie year, really came out of nowhere, and that was great. He averaged five yards a carry. But the Bears' offensive line had the seventh-best run and blocking unit last year. His yards per carry dropped by a yard, like a whole yard. Like that's yeah, something happened there. It did, right. And if you're a good running back, that those kinds of things don't happen. So, yeah, I'd agree with both of you guys. I think Howard uh, is on his way out there. I don't know. It happened with Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley was horrible two years ago, and he's clearly one of the best running backs in football. <laughs> he's the number that, one dynasty pick in most formats. Yeah, <laughs> True, I but I feel like Todd Gurley wasn't dropping 12 passes. Correct. Out. Yeah. Jordan Howard is not Todd Gurley. No, he's, no, <laughs> he's yeah. not even the same class, no. <laughs> So uh, let's move on to your, uh, your number two buy at running back, Michael. Who else do you have for us? Uh, you know, and, and I may be uh, biased. In fact, I am going to be biased. But uh, I'm pretty high on the Jarek McKinnon train at this point. Um, which, look, don't get me wrong. Is everyone else uh, on the planet going to be? Probably. So uh, it, it, there probably will never be a better time to get in on that than now. But, I mean, the fact that the 49ers made him literally the highest-priced running back this offseason um, they don't really have a ready-made option for that sort of pass-catching uh, role there. I mean, they've got a couple guys that could take that, Joe Williams, Matt Breda, but again, I think they brought McKinnon in to be that, that three-down back if he can do it. And look, you got to look at the coaching. you got Kyle Shanahan there who molded Devontae Freeman into what he is now, and I just think that's what their sort of goal is. And it's very possible they draft a complimentary back, and that's fine, but I really think McKinnon, at least for the short term, is going to uh, try to be that Devontae Freeman type for that offense. Yeah, everyone talks like uh, Jerry McKinnon so small because he was some pass catching running back. The dude's two hundred and five pounds, five foot nine, right. two hundred and five pounds. He was a hoss in the combine. I mean, we're talking about one of the best athletes we've ever seen in the combine. And literally about the same build as Devontae Freeman. I mean, yes, look it up. They got the same height and the same weight. So. Yeah, I'm pretty excited. Like I said, the only the only issue with that is I think everyone else is probably going to be in on that bandwagon too. I agree, but I don't think they're high enough on McKinnon. I think I think you can still buy low on him. McKinnon's still a good buy. Like talking to some people, uh, I found someone the other day that was able to get him for a second round rookie pick. Ooh, and if great. you if you really? can do that, I would actually I would actually trade a late uh, if you can get McKinnon for anywhere from the seventh through the twelfth pick. I would actually trade that for McKinnon. Um, yeah. I would actually debate trading McKinnon. Like I would rather I would debate taking McKinnon 
over someone like uh, like we like we just talked about Derrick Henry. I would debate taking him over that guy. But that's the thing is like it depends on the league. Do you play in a PPR? Do you play in a standard? Most dynasty leagues are PPR. So I would prefer McKinnon. But here's the thing: like more, you're obviously a San Francisco fan. But do you think that they're going to draft a running back? Because I think they're not done here. I, I don't think that they're done with the running back position just because they signed McKinnon to this deal. I think they have the cap space. And I believe they add uh, someone who's a better early down back than him because – Like Joe Williams? Yeah, well, no, God, no. <laughs> uh, no, no, stop with that. <laughs> but, no, like what if, they, what if they went out there and spent like a, a third-round pick on Nick Chubb or something like that? Would that change the way you view McKinnon? Or do you think he's pretty set in his role and you expect him to share a lot of those touches? Yeah, I think he's pretty set in that role. And, look, if Nick Chubb – now, don't get me wrong. If Nick Chubb – falls to the third yeah they should take him but I I don't see that happening personally so uh, but unless they get one of those top five running back prospects and, and you know it's a fairly uh, a solid consensus there Chubb Michelle Guise something like that but uh, beyond that no I think his role's pretty set and I do expect them to take it back I really do uh, I just expect them to take it probably later um, mm-hmm. and to pair that that running back with McKinnon and honestly probably to compete with the plethora of guys they got there now between Williams, between Breda, between um, we all know, uh, we all remember Jeremy McNichols, don't we? He's still there. So yeah. um, there's just a lot of guys. I think that they're going to do the shotgun approach and uh, see what sticks for that role. You know, guys, I was thinking how high I would be willing to trade for Jarek McKinnon because we know what he's going to be, right? I, I feel very confident Jarek McKinnon is going to be a three-down back. I think he can be Devontae Freeman. I really believe that. Now, I'm thinking, you got Barkley going number one. Who are you guys taking number two in your rookie dynasty drafts? Because it is completely up in the air for me. I don't, I don't know who to take. Well, I, landing, I might trade it for McKinnon. Well, landing spot matters, right? And no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't move that number two or number three pick for McKinnon um, because I, I, it's going to be one of Darius Geis or Sony Michelle. I prefer Sony Michelle right now. He's my number two running back in this class because he's a complete running back. Like he's like, to me, my, com- my comparison for him is LaShawn McCoy. Ooh. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a guy that is a better pass blocker than McCoy. He may not be just as shifty, but he's close. Um, Sony Michelle is going to be a, a playmaker. I just hope he lands in an offense that'll, that'll kind of showcase that. So he's my number two right now. But landing spot matters. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that it yeah, doesn't. Yeah, you could get in a Derrick Henry situation, right? That would be absolutely horrible. Yeah, it all depends on where they land. Like, or Devonta Freeman. Devonta Freeman's stock took a massive hit when Tevin Coleman is still there. Like, that's what I'm saying. Like, when he came back to the lineup, he took a massive hit. You have to take all these things into consideration. You're right. And it, it's like, just because I love Royce Freeman, I think Royce Freeman is going to be an excellent running back in this, in this draft class. That doesn't mean that he's going to land on the right team where it's going to get to you know, he's going to get to showcase his skills on first and second down. I think he would be a perfect compliment to Jarek McKinnon personally. Um, I would love to see that happen, and he might be able to be had in the fourth round. Uh, But, yeah, so, I mean, landing spot is going to matter. So I try not to think about that too much, but I would also – I'd rather have Calvin Ridley than – than Jarek McKinnon so and I know I'm wow. in the minority I know I'm in the minority yes you are <laughs> uh, Michael who would you take number two and would you uh, prefer McKinnon over them uh no I think I'm I'm with Mike on this and, and honestly to echo what Mike said it's just unless you've got just a a clear-cut talent like Barkley who's so far ahead of everyone it's just super hard to to figure that out but look it's the same guys that a lot of other people are saying whether it's Geis Michelle Chubb. Um, I've seen a lot of stuff about Ronald Jones that mm-hmm. might make me consider that. So, um, and now would I take McKinnon over any of those guys? Oh man, it would be really, really close, and it really would depend on the landing spot. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, if there's a, a, a team that drafts a guy with a clear cut uh, three down roll for him, no, I wouldn't take uh, that player. I would take that player over McKinnon, but short of that, it would be really, really close. Right. As before we jump on over to uh, tags number two by, I want to tell you all about the sponsor of today's show, RX Bar. So as you all know, I've been uh, working out for the combine. I've tried a handful of protein bars. RX Bars are simply the best on the market. They use real food core ingredients, three egg whites, two dates, six almonds, no BS. It turns out real food ingredients actually taste really good. I'm telling you all that blueberry RX Bar tastes like candy too. It's my very favorite. RX Bars are gluten-free. Soy free, dairy free, no added sugar, no artificial colors, flavors, preservatives, or fillers. Like I said, no BS. They've got 11 delicious flavor varieties, and you're sure to find one that you absolutely love. It's probably going to be the blueberry because it is amazing. You can support RX Bar for sponsoring our show and keep it free for you all. And they give you a great deal if you do. For 25% off your first order, 
Visit rxbar.com slash fantasy pros and enter promo code fantasy pros at checkout. All right, Tags, who's your uh, number two buy here at running back? All right, I know we got to get through cells and all the other positions. I'm going to make it quick. It's Amir Abdullah. And I, I say that because I believe that the Lions may be trading away Abdullah here at some point. And um, I'm not going to forget that I actually view him a lot like Jerick McKinnon. Uh, we're in the fact that I think he was in the wrong offense. I think he was being in the wrong role. I don't think he knew how to run behind the line that he had. Uh, you know, Amir Abdullah is a very patient runner like he, he dances a little bit behind the line of scrimmage and it's because he's waiting for a hole to open up something that the Lions offensive line simply doesn't do and it was something that Jarek McKinnon was dealing with throughout his entire career until the second half of last year where I saw him start to get more downhill he started to learn I can't do this anymore like I have to get downhill and he started running the ball better I think Amir Abdullah just needs a change of scenery and I think that's going to happen looking at the draft and that I don't think LeGarrette Blunt is the long-term solution I think they draft a running back but now they have Blunt potentially a rookie running back and Theo Riddick. I, I just don't think I'd all, all mix and matches with all the trades that we've seen going on in the NFL. I could see Amir Abdullah going somewhere else, getting another shot, maybe playing opposite like with Kenyon Drake, where, you know, Frank Gore, he's obviously there to just try and get uh, to his career milestone. Uh, but I, I do think Amir Abdullah, he's right now, he's being drafted as the 64th running back off the board. Wow. This guy was taken as a second round pick just two years ago. And I, I'm not giving up on his talent. I just think that the offensive line and like what Theo Riddick does there took away from everything they should have been using Abdullah to, to do in the first place. So I, I would love to see him in a different place. And because of that, and being he's essentially free, I think that he's a great buy low. It's a good buy considering how cheap he is. But I mean, I, I love his ceiling, but where is he going to play? Who needs a running back like Amir Abdullah? I, I don't see him getting the workload. It's tough to say, honestly, you know, running back is a, it's a, it's going to youth. And that's why I was surprised to see a lot of these veteran running backs like the Garrett Blunt, like Jonathan Stewart, Chris Ivory, like Isaiah Crowell to see those guys get jobs because it's like, what are you doing? Like, why are we, why are we taking these two down backs that are plotters that just get what's blocked and, and that's, that's it. Why not, you know, shoot for the home run. Um, I think we're going to start to see more of a youth movement uh, once these teams realize what these running backs actually are. I think that's why the Jets started signing even more running backs after they signed Isaiah Crowell. But Amir Abdullah, is, he's still very, very young. He's got limited touches on his frame, just 24 years old. Again, I mean, it's not to say that he's going to walk into a workhorse role. That's not going to happen. But, you know, a team that can use him as, in a timeshare, absolutely. And he's going to have more value than he does in Detroit. Somebody with a very similar value in terms of dynasty to, uh, to Amir Abdullah is Ty Montgomery. That's my second buy. I talked about him on the mock draft episode. Everyone's talking about Aaron Jones. Yeah, he was the best running back they had last year. Uh, it, like Tag said, it was really only one game, though. Jamal Williams was not very efficient. Ty Montgomery, I mean, he struggled. But you look at the teams they played before he was injured, and it wasn't very it – was, it was a tough schedule. Ty Montgomery was their starting running back for a reason. They believe in him. And don't forget, he's the best receiver of them all. This is a passing offense. They're not going to be having, uh, you know, Hundley passing this year. It's going to be Aaron Rodgers. So I think Ty Montgomery has a decent chance to end up the starting running back in a great offense. You can get him for super cheap right now. Michael, who do you like better between Amir Abdullah and Ty Montgomery as a by <laughs> Uh I can't say neither, right? I <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think relative to where they're being drafted, I think you could make the case that they're, they're good values. I mean, don't get me wrong. I was as big a fan of Abdullah as anyone heading into last year um, because at the time he'd only played two seasons, one of those pretty much knocked out due to injury. But last year I just really soured on him, Mike. I'm not going to lie. I mean, 3.3 yards of carry and – it just, I don't know, between the injury the second year, the ineffectiveness the third year, he's trending down for me, man. And, look, he's a 64th running back, so do I think he's probably better than, you know, maybe 50 other running backs? Sure, but, you know, I'm not willing to sort of shell out a lot for to, to see what happens. And Montgomery, man, I, I've given up trying to figure out the Packers running back situation. And, and honestly, who cares? It's all about Aaron Rodgers in the passing game there anyway, so – uh, if they ever truly commit to a running back and they start giving one guy 15 carries a game consistently, then I will buy in. But to me, they're just mixing and matching at this point to uh, to see what goes best with Rodgers. Game it's a lottery game. ticket, man. You got Let's say Montgomery's the third dog. You've got a one in five chance of having a top 10 running back because Green Bay Packers are going to be a top offense and tags. I mean, share the stat about top offenses, what they do with running backs. Well, that's the thing is like when talking about the running backs, I'll do that article again this year. I did it last year on, on what top scoring offense is what they mean. If you have a top six scoring offense, that's where, you know, I, I want to say if you if it's top six offense and you have the workhorse there, it's like a 60% chance they're an RB1. So it's trying to find those running backs is really important. 
But I mean, we're talking about value, right? And, and like, you know, more, you said it, you know, you're not going to give away the farm t- to take these guys. Amir Abdullah, he moved down my board as well. I'm not going to sit here and pretend that he's the, you know, the top five pick that he was in the draft in 2015. I'm not going to pretend that, but the guy, some guys being taken in front of him in startup dynasty drafts, Peyton Barber, Jeremy Hill, Austin Ackler, uh, Marshawn Lynch, Josh Adams. Like, what are we talking about here? <laughs> so for me, it, that's what I'm saying. Matt Breida, he's one that's ahead of him. And that's, so if there, if he's so low right now, I believe you can get him for like a third round pick. And if you've read my article that I put up on the site, uh, it was last week. What is a dynasty draft pick actually worth? You would understand that a third round pick is worth essentially nothing. Um, it, seriously, like the, the odds of that player panning out might be like a 5% chance. So you're talking about a lottery pick. So Amir Abdullah, let's say if he goes to the Chargers, apparently the Chargers are looking to add more depth behind Melvin Gordon. That's a good one. That's not a good convinced. spot. If Amir Abdullah goes to the Chargers to play opposite him, I believe he's a better running back than Melvin Gordon. So that would be an interesting spot. And that's what I'm saying. When you're talking about Abdullah, you're not going to trade for him to start on your dynasty team. You're, you're trading for the upside and the fact that he's a former second round pick. And that's why Todd Gurley, people didn't want to give up on him, right? Because he, he was, a, he was so, he was claimed to be so good and it just, it took the right offense. So I just, that's where I'm at with, with Abdullah, where I think he's one of the better bench stashes in Dynasty. Before we move on to ourselves really quick at running back, I don't want to let this slide. Everyone calls me Mr. Hot Take. Did you guys just hear what Tag said? Tags just said Amir Abdullah is a better running back than Melvin Gordon. His Twitter is at Mike Tag the <laughs> NFL. Make sure to let him know what you think about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's I, I I don't think Melvin Gordon's that good. I think he's he's a product yeah, of that I offense. I agree. I don't know if Amir Abdullah is better, but um, yeah, <laughs> anyway. That might be fair. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, Michael, you already named one of your cells. Who was your other cell that you have for us? Oh, well, you know, and, and this time of year, don't get me wrong, it's always hard because, especially between free agency and draft, right? Because some moves have been made, some haven't been. But, you know, if it were me, I'd probably go, I'd probably go Jay Ajayi, honestly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, you know, his value was fairly high going into last season because of the big uh, stats he put up with Miami. And look, even the knock at the time was, uh, there were a couple 200-yard games that were sort of outliers for the rest of the season, and I get it. And don't get me wrong, I think going to Philadelphia was a good move for him, but to still see him, at least you know, according to our PFF ranks, as kind of a mid to late teens as far as a, a dynasty running back, I don't really get it. I don't understand it. And I don't think Philadelphia is a place that is going to have a bell cow back. They like to use uh, pass catchers for running backs in that role. I mean, whether it's Darren Sproles, uh, whether it could be Corey Clement this year, but I just don't understand, I guess, the uh, affinity people have for Ajayi. I completely agree uh, on this one. Doug Peterson, uh, the Eagles, like one of, uh, it was a stat I found. It was, oh man, it was in the middle of last season, but uh, when Jay Ajayi was traded to the the Eagles, the stat that I found, Doug Peterson, there's only been one running back under Doug Peterson who played more than uh, 70% of snaps in a game, and that was Darren Sproles. Darren Sproles, and you're not going to put Jay Ajayi in a Darren Sproles type role. So, uh, yeah, did, Jay Ajayi, actually, a uh, fun stat I found when start, I started going through last year's stats, he had seven games where he totaled 16 or more touches. Did you know he did not score 15 PPR points in a single game? 14.6 was his highest output. And the funny thing is, is, like, people wanted to say it was all about Miami. I'm pretty sure Kenyon Drake did a damn good job when he took yes, over he did. there. Yeah. And when you go to Philadelphia, you have one of the best offensive lines in football. LeGarrette Blunt had a game over 15 PPR points. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm not a big JHI guy. I mean, I, I feel like he's serviceable. I feel like he's fine. But I'm with more on this one. He's definitely a sell. I think Tags just talked him into uh, being my number one sell. Even over, you know, <laughs> Alex Collins was not my number one sell. He was like the fringe guy. My number one sell before this conversation was Kareem Hunt. I've talked about it every show. I probably will remind you over and over and over again this preseason. Spencer Ware is really good. Andy Reid loves using two running backs. He always has, except for last year, because he had nobody besides Kareem Hunt. Now he has Spencer Ware. He's going to get 40% of the touches. Kareem Hunt's stock is going way down, and he might be in legal trouble. Be careful with him. Yeah, Kareem Hunt, hey, that's a tough one, right? I, I mean, I don't know if I ever envisioned his ceiling to be where it is. I knew that with Andy Reid, it could be. You know, that's why we talked about when Spencer Ware went down, that Kareem Hunt was, he was worthy of a second round pick. Um, but I, I'm with you in a, in a way where it's like, the, there's only so high a value you can get before you realize, okay, this is his ceiling. Now, I don't, 
there's a lot of questions about this offense, right? We have Patrick Mahomes taking over. Will he live up to the hype? A lot of people are expecting like QB one type things out of him. Like he could be, you know, the next Drew Brees or something like that. Like the, the hype around Patrick Mahomes is out of control as a matter of fact, but they do have some really good receiving options there. I don't know if Kareem Hunt's going to be checked down to as much under Patrick Mahomes as he was with Alex Smith. Is he a special running back? I mean, we'll find out as the time goes on, but he had a lull in production in 2017. We won't pretend, pretend he didn't. The touches were there. Uh, you know, Spencer Ware should be involved, but he had a, a ma- major injury too. So with my cell, I would actually <laughs> – I said Jordan Howard, but my other one is Alvin Kamara. And those are the sn- number six and number seven running backs in ADP right now. And Kamara I have more as a cell – because Kamara, Bobby, I mentioned this in our last podcast. Alvin Kamara did not touch the ball twenty times in a single game last year, so and he's not going to. It's that's that's not going to change. Mark Ingram's still there. Yeah, and well, Mark Ingram's got one year left on his deal. But let's pretend. Let's not pretend that Drew Brees is going to play forever, guys. Like this, this offense isn't always going to spit out points. Alvin Kamara was ridiculously efficient last year, like to the point where like he broke records, efficiency record numbers. He finishes the number four running back. He was still behind Todd Gurley, Le'Veon Bell, and Kareem Hunt. So why are we putting him, like, we're almost drafting him at his ceiling. And I loved Alvin Kamara coming out. Like, I was one of the, the people saying that I compared his game to what Jamal Charles did. But the thing is, I don't think that he's ever going to be like Jamal Charles, where he's going to average six yards per carry every single season. I think Alvin Kamara, his, his, it's going to come down to, to normal. Like, he's not going to be as efficient as he was. So I just don't like owning someone when they're at their max ceiling, where if they take a step back, you're losing value. So, granted, when you're trading away one of these players like Kareem Hunt, like Alvin Kamara, you better get maximum return. Uh, but at the same time, right now, if, if there is a time to sell, it's now. So who would you rather have, Alvin Kamara or Zach Center? <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just messing with you, man. Yeah, I agree. I Alvin Kamara was my number three sell. I considered him for this list. And, uh, you know, I could have put him on there. I, I think it's a very good call. I don't know, Mike. I mean, if we're talking PPR leagues, to me, Kamara, the pass catching really justifies that position there. Because if it's PPR, it's one point per reception. I mean, you've got to remember, if he's catching 80 balls like he did last year, which – don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that's, you know, easily uh, replicated, but even if he catches 60-70, that's equivalent to 500-600 rushing yards in most of them, you know. So, uh, and I get what you're saying about being efficient and how you can't possibly keep that up. I mean, don't get me wrong, if he goes on like a Jamal Charles type run where he averages five yards a carry for his career, then great. I don't know that that will happen, but to me, it's all about the pass catching there, and I, I just don't see anyone challenging him in that offense for that role for the foreseeable future which I think keeps him up there for me anyway well here's the question though is he involved in the passing game anymore you know they Cameron Meredith we found out today the news broke that the Bears weren't matching the offer so Cameron Meredith is now there they did re-sign Willie Sneed which is a weird thing in all itself but but I'm not envisioning Willie Sneed being involved but they have Cameron Meredith who they they paid 10 million dollars over two years it's not like a large amount but it's not a small investment the Ted Ginn's there Michael Thomas is there so you add Meredith and I also I am my mock draft has had them drafting a tight end. They address a lot of their defensive concerns in free agency. They could still look that way, but I really feel like they're a team built to make a Super Bowl run. And they use the tight end so much in the past that I could see them going with a Mike Gesicki or a Hayden Hurst in the first round that like all these targets, somebody has to start losing some. And it's not to say that he's going to drop down to 50 receptions. You use Alvin Kamara, right? But scoring 13 touchdowns on you know what was it 200 touchdowns or 200 touches I that's what I don't think keeps up I think that Drew Brees his touchdown total comes up some of the rushing totals come down I just feel like that's his ceiling I just don't know if and again I'm a Kareem Hunt or uh, Alvin Kamara fan it's just I don't it's just so high for a guy that's not a workhorse Guys, let's move on over to wide receiver, and I'm going to go first. I'm going to do two at once here so we can kind of get the ball rolling. Uh, it's kind of weird. My two, my two buys at running back were Cohen and Montgomery, who were drafted like 50th and stuff. My wide receiver buys, Devontae Adams. I know this is like a gimme to anyone who listens to the podcast. Here's the thing. Everybody is is excited about Adams. The hype has not come far enough. You can still get him for cheaper than he's actually worth. And then Des Bryant. Well, last year, I mean, Tags talked about this last episode. Last year, his uh, his opponents were so good. That's not going to happen every single year. And I just think people are panicking on Des Bryant, thinking his career's over. It's not. He's got several years left. I think you can get him for pennies right now. 
Des is weird because like I was going through this and I thought Des would be on my list as well, but he's still being taken as like the 25th receiver in startups. So it's not like you're getting a major discount. I thought he was going to be outside the top 30 with the way people talk about him. So many people are down on Des Bryant. And honestly, there's news that's probably going to come out on Friday. He's meeting with Jerry Jones. He could be released if he's refused, if he refuses to take a pay cut. I think it would be a mistake on Dallas's part, but it is what it is. And if he hits the free agent market, I'm really intrigued to see where he would go. But his price just didn't get seem like it was low enough compared to all the things. I I wouldn't sell Des Bryant. My my I think the best point there is that if you own him in a dynasty league, don't panic and sell him. I wouldn't. Yeah, I, 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 see, I think most people are panic and selling him. I don't buy into the dynasty startup ADPs as much in terms of buying and selling because that's who is the number one most excited person in the league. How high is he willing to take Des Bryant? Not who has Des Bryant, like the normal person who has Des Bryant and he's suffered through him for a long time. And now he's like, oh, that's it. I'm selling him. I think that's more of the attitude rather than the guy who's reaching for him. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the case. Like Will Fuller, someone might be able to trade Will Fuller for Des Bryant right now. I give me Des Bryant. Oh like, man. Yes. <laughs> seriously. That's, that's where I would be. So, I mean, and the Devonte Adams, it's funny. I had him on my list too. I think that the hype has not reached to the point where it should. Um, his, it, the ECR right now on him is at number nine, the number nine receiver. You can make the case that he should be top six uh, tied to Aaron Rodgers for the rest of his career, essentially. Give me Devonte Adams every single day of the week. He's a wide receiver one. I think you could make a case he's better than Julio Jones in Dynasty. No, stop it. <laughs> Wait, are you are you serious? Like you think that's not even a conversation? Julio Jones is is injury prone. He can't score touchdowns. He's a lot older than Adams. He doesn't have Aaron Rodgers as his quarterback. This is a conversation, man. Julio Jones is a freak. Yeah, um, absolutely, is, no doubt so about it. He's not going to get ten touchdown receptions this year. You know, Adams is. That's the thing is like Julio, you never had to worry about touchdowns because he would get it done in yardage. Now the, the touchdowns should have been the topper on the cake. And that's where Julio Jones has never lived up to the hype of number one or number two dynasty receiver. But Julio Jones is like one of the most efficient wide receivers ever. And like people talk about it so much about how, oh, he's boomer bust. That's kind of cra- that's that's not that's a false narrative. Um, I like that's what I do. Like in the offseason, I start going through numbers. Julio Jones in his career has been at least a wide receiver three in 74% of his games, at least like that's, that's minimum. He's only busted like scoring fewer than eight PPR points. He's only busted 13 times over his entire career. So Julio Jones is not boom or bust. He just doesn't live up to the boom that everybody expected him to be. I still think that I honestly don't know if we, if we've even seen Julio Jones's ceiling, I think there's a lot more to him as a player. I just don't know if it's ever going to come out because Atlanta, Matt Ryan is Matt Ryan as good as some people think he is. I don't think so. I think Julio Jones has made Matt Ryan a better quarterback, but I also don't think that he's the type of quarterback that can take a wide receiver like Julio Jones and bring him to the next level. Like if, if, if Julio Jones had played with Ben Roethlisberger or Aaron Rodgers, Julio Jones would be in the conversation for best wide receiver of all time. Yeah, definitely. Like what's the next level though, Mike, he's had 1400 yards for four years in a row. <laughs> he's, that's what I'm saying. Like, I believe Julio is the type of wide receiver that could do like Megatron type things where it's like, give him 150, 170 targets. Like I think he so will, too. 1800 yards. I believe he can score double digit touchdowns. But again, I, I feel like there's some limitations with Matt Ryan. And I don't think Matt Ryan's a bad quarterback. I just don't think that he's like, you know, I know he won an MVP award, people. Don't don't come at me with that. But I'm just saying I think that he's an above average NFL quarterback. Whereas like I think Julio's kind of capped where he's at in that offense. Did he win the MVP award or did Shanahan win the MVP award? <laughs> 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 Michael, what do you think about Devontae Adams and Des Bryant? Uh, well, it's uh, well, Des Bryant, let me just say, Mike has had a love affair with Des going back like three years when me and him did podcasts. So like, that's not surprising to me that Mike is still uh, fawning over Des Bryant. But <laughs> um, I yeah, I don't know. I'm not a fan of Des, um, honestly, anymore. <laughs> I don't know, it, you know, relative to where his value is. And look, like you said, Mike, if I were trading uh, Will Fuller for Des Bryant, yes, I'd take Des Bryant. But do I think he's anywhere close to the fringe wide receiver one that he was uh, even, you know, a couple years ago? No. I mean, he had that really good streak of three years of like 100 catches, 1,300 yards, like 12 touchdowns each season. It was Odell Beckham-esque. But, you know, between the age and the injuries and, quite frankly, just the system they have there, I don't, I don't see it. And honestly – and I think this probably doesn't hasn't gotten a lot of attention, but it has here locally. I like Alan Hearns there. I think Alan Hearns is going to be okay. I mean, and and not to say it's going to take away drastically from Dez, but I think that they will probably find ways to get Alan Hearns more involved than they did Terrence Williams. So I think it helps Dez. 
yeah, I do too. Uh, so I just don't know that Dez is going to be that sort of uh, volume sort of monster that he used to be. If that makes sense. So Mike, uh, why don't you give us your final buy and then we'll move on to Michael for his, uh, his two buys. Uh, well, and I'll name a couple guys sort of in the spirit of what you did, Bobby. So, um, you know, and again, I'm biased, but it's what I know best. I'm going to go Pierre Garcon at this point. Great call. Um, you know, real target monster always has been, uh, and people forget, he didn't play a single down with Jimmy Garoppolo uh, last year. And he was still, it through half the season, catching, I think, 40 balls, 500 yards. He was top 10 in both of those uh, through the injury. So if you've got him now with Garoppolo, um, and look, they didn't sign anyone in free agency for receiver. Uh, they, you know, when they had a ton of money, they went out and got a running back instead. So, and don't get me wrong, is it entirely possible they draft a receiver in the second or third round? Sure, but I don't know that that person would would overtake Garcon in the offense. So, to me, uh, that's a really good value right now because I think he's still going to be the number one receiver there, despite Marquise Goodwin. And yes, he got an extension, but I just don't see anyone else there getting the volume that that he would. That's fair. Um, uh, so I'll give my buys before we go on. I'm going to let you guys pick from these. I'm just going to throw some names out here because wide receiver was tough to narrow it down to two because I think there's quite a few players that you could buy right now. Uh, I think John Ross is one of the best buys in dynasty football. I got him the other day for a third round pick. Um, Jordan Matthews, currently the number 70 wide receiver in startups. Obviously, he signed with the Patriots. I don't know if there's a lag in that, but Jordan Matthews is a great buy. Geronimo Allison, uh, everybody's talking about Devontae Adams, but nobody's talking about the guy that's going to step in, uh, unless they draft a wide receiver, which I think is entirely possible. But Geronimo Allison's outside the top 100 receivers, so he might be on your waiver wire. Grab Geronimo Allison if he's on your waiver wire. Uh, and, and I'm going to mention a rookie because it's kind of ridiculous how far I'm seeing him fall, but Calvin Ridley. Calvin Ridley <laughs> is going in the – uh, right around the 110 range in dynasty drafts right now. No, he's Dyn- not. Are you dynasty rookie serious? Drafts. I kid you not. He's fallen so far. People are overblowing this combine thing. Uh, if you, if you have the number six or number seven pick in your dynasty rookie draft, like, or if, if you can get him, like if you can grab him there, great. If you, if you can trade into that spot for, you know, something cheaper, do it. Like seriously, Calvin Ridley, he should be in the conversation for top three rookie picks. I, I believe the ceiling there is bigger than people realize. I am, I am all on board, and I'm, I'm fully putting myself out there saying that I believe in Calvin Ridley, and I believe he's uber talented, and I think people are going to look back and be like, you know what, maybe we overvalued yeah. his broad jump. Maybe we overvalued his broad jump. Maybe we should have just watched the tape and seen what he did to cornerbacks. He abused them continually. I mean, his ceiling isn't great and everything, but – I think it is. He is super. You think his ceiling's great? Okay. Well, I I mean, he is super polished. What I'm trying to say is he's a top 30 wide receiver this year as a rookie. I I really think so. I I don't think he's going to be a great wide receiver in this league, but I think he's going to come right in and be an impact receiver for whatever team. I think it's going to be Baltimore. Yeah, the Ravens is where I have him going right now. I'm not happy about that. I would rather have him go somewhere else. I wish Green Bay. Be a great spot. You know what? I take it back. I don't want Green Bay to draft him. That's like the worst case scenario for me. Um, <laughs> but I'm saying from a fantasy standpoint, if he went to go take that place for Jordy Nelson, like, good God. That'd be pretty sweet, man. I love all the names that you mentioned. They're, uh, they're all great buys right now. I think Jordan Matthews is the best. I can't believe I left him off my list because I was writing about him earlier today. And I am so crazy about Matthews going and playing with Tom Brady. I think he could be really good. Yeah, and sort of echo that, Mike. I mean, people, I don't know if they realize or not, but the Patriots have lost a lot of targets this offseason, right? Between trading away Cooks, they let Amendola walk. Um, So especially for that slot role where Matthews is at his best, and you got to believe Belichick knows that to be true too. Um, Yeah, I I completely agree. I mean, I think he could be a a super good value, um, especially as we get a little closer to the draft. Belichick knows everything. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> all right guys wide receiver sells again i'll go uh, pretty fast here they're both on the same team josh gordon and jarvis landry they are in a, a crowded wide receiver core they've t- currently got tyrod taylor throwing them passes it sounds like josh allen is going to be throwing it over their heads here in a few days <laughs> and uh you know I, I i think josh gordon everyone's excited about him being back they're going to say he's got a full off season he's this super athlete he's going to get 1600 yards again not everyone's going to say that, but someone in your league wants to buy Josh Gordon. I guarantee it. Go sell him. Jarvis Landry, not going to be anywhere near the same. He's, he was in a perfect situation. Now he's in the worst possible situation. He's an obvious sell, but still sell him. If they draft Josh Allen, why did they trade for Jarvis Landry? 
That's my question. Like, if they knew that they were going to draft Josh Allen, which reportedly some people are saying, oh, they'd known they'd, they were going to drop Josh, Josh Allen since back in January. This has to be a practical joke. I, I, no, like, I, I know don't... April Fool's Day is gone, but, like, maybe <laughs> they first said it April 1st and they're just holding out. Well, Landry was on my list, too, for what it's worth. He's still going as the number 17 wide receiver in startups, and that's just way, 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 way. You're talking about – that's where he's essentially been. Um, ever since he came into the league, he's finished a little bit better than that, but he's also been seeing an average 145 targets. And that's not going to happen. Yeah. I'm sorry. So yeah, I'm in with, with bringing Tyrod Taylor in. It says that they want to go run heavy. They're not having Tyrod Taylor throw the ball 550 times. It's not happening. Yeah. They're going to have Saquon Barkley and Carlos Hyde and Duke Johnson. Like what, what are they thinking? I don't know what the Browns are doing. And if they draft Josh <laughs> Allen, they deserve to be bad for a long time. That's all I got to say on this matter because they've already started to blunder everything Sashi did. So um, more, where are you at on this? Like, do you think Josh Gordon is being overvalued? I actually agree with Bobby in that some, somebody in your league wants to buy Josh Gordon for more than he's worth. And uh, Jarvis Landry. You know, all of this just makes me super sad for Corey Coleman. Quite <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, I mean, and look, I, I had a lot of Corey Coleman shares back in the day. I've tried to get rid of all of them because it's like they just completely discarded him now. Uh, but, you know, with Gordon, it's so hard to pin down a value because, like you guys said, it's just all over the place. You know, some people have him super high. And, look, I've seen people hold out for a King's ransom for him while others are very happy to let him go when he plays. Do I think he's a wide receiver one? Yeah, but it, there's just so much doubt there for me anyway, on if he's actually going to stick with it now with Landry. Yeah, I'm with you guys. I don't know what they're doing there. I mean, they drafted David Joku last year too. So like, I mean, how many targets do they expect to have? Because you can only have so many. So uh, Taylor's going to throw the ball 800 times this year. <laughs> and look, uh, great. Uh, we can finally, uh, we can all rest easy knowing he's the quarterback one we all thought he could be. For what it's worth, I think it's Sam Darnold. I think Sam Darnold's number one. So I don't, I don't think that they do the Josh Allen thing. And like I said, if they do, well, we know where they, what they belong. Yeah, <laughs> we'll see. All right. I'm probably just going to take like Mason Rudolph and surprise us all. All right, more. I'm going to give my two cells. You're going to give your two cells. And then we're okay. going to ask Bobby, which one has the best cell of the four. All right. Okay. My two cells, one Keenan Allen, he's going as the sixth wide receiver off the board. I'm sorry. People, people like, stop, just please stop. Um, Mike Williams, they drafted him for a reason. He's the more prototypical number one. It's not to say Keenan Allen is going to go away, but he's not the number six wide receiver. Uh, and Tyreek Hill, Tyreek Hill still going as the 11th wide receiver off the board blows my mind. Uh, you know, even before Sammy Watkins was signed, I would have had some questions, but I would have understood it a little bit. But when you sign a wide receiver for $50 million, Sammy Watkins, a better wide receiver than Tyreek Hill. And yes, I stand by that. Sammy Watkins is a better receiver than Tyreek Hill when healthy. Um, they're going to give him the ball. And that's the thing. Like everybody in this offense lost some of their upside, including Watkins, including Travis Kelsey, including Kareem Hunt. So to see Tyreek Hill here in, in wide receiver one territory, I need to remind people that even without Sammy Watkins there last year, they did throw the ball a little bit more, even without Chris Conley, who was hurt for the majority of the season, even with nobody else there outside of Travis Kelsey, Tyreek Hill saw 105 targets. I don't think people realize how hard it is to finish as a top 24 receiver if you're not seeing 100 plus targets. So I'm, I, I don't get it. I don't get the Tyreek Hill. Love. Plus they're losing Alex Smith, MVP candidate, and they're getting Chris Conley back. Oh, stop with the Chris Conley thing. No, I'm holding <laughs> on to Chris Conley longer than I'm holding on to Kevin White. You cannot pry him away. That's too funny. No. All right. So more, you got to give your two and then Bobby's going to rule on the, on who's the best sell of the group. All right. So real quick, what's funny is I originally had Tyreek Hill as one of my cells because, if, and for all the reasons you just said, they brought in Watkins um, there's just not enough targets to go around, but uh, I was looking at it a little more. So like you said, the chiefs averaged 34 pass attempts last year, which was slightly better than they're used to. Um, the top team that passed the most did it 38 times, attempted 38 passes a game. Okay. So if the chiefs add a couple more targets a game, you're looking at maybe, what is that? Like maybe 40, 50 more targets to go around on the season. Right. To me, I mean, that could be a void for Sammy Watkins to fill right in. He could get 20 to 30 more catches um, than their second receiver did last year, which was Albert Wilson, who only had 42. So if you're adding 20 to 30 catches to Albert Wilson's line, that's still at the 70 to 75 for Sammy Watkins. Personally, I think there will be enough to go around there to make them both valuable. And if you look at Watkins' contract, 
it's essentially a two-year deal, meaning they can cut him in year three and save a ton of money, which just so happens to be the same time that Tyree kills up for an extension. So I say all that to say I, I was on the Tyree kill sell bandwagon, but upon further review, I have changed my mind. Mike, so <laughs> You changed my mind a little bit too, because I was, I was like, I don't know if he's going to be able to beat these two. Now you've got a chance. Let's hear, let's hear it. Who are your cells? So my cells are going to be, uh, and this does make me sad, uh, T.Y. Hilton who, you know, I, I think people are probably ranking him based on his production, not what will happen in the next couple of years, right? And look, all of this goes back to Andrew Luck. And I may be a super pessimistic person, but until I see Andrew Luck on the field, I'm not going to believe it. I'm just not. I mean, you can't trust anyone there anymore. You just can't. Anytime they put an injury report out, you got to take it with a grain of salt. So, with T.Y., I mean, obviously, you know, didn't perform that well last year with Jacoby Brissett there. Who knows what their plan is this year between Brissett and Luck. So, you know, and I still see Hilton in that fringe wide receiver 1-2 ranking, and I don't get it. I don't think he's very reliable at this point. And the other thing is he's super reliant on the deep ball. If he doesn't get, you know, enough targets, if they go down even further, I mean, he's host. He's not going to match the production he had during that four-year run when Luck was actually healthy. So that's one of them. Um, another one, but for probably different reasons, is probably Juju Smith-Schuster for me. I mean, I'm seeing him his ranking go super high. I mean, I'm talking like late teens, early 20s as far as dynasty rankings go. And don't get me wrong, I think he's a great receiver. I think you could start him as a, a safe wide receiver 2-3 this year. But I don't know if I would take him above some of the other receivers that are ranked right behind him, especially for the foreseeable future. So those would be my two, Juju and T.Y. My favorite one of all of these is, uh, is the Keenan Allen call, which is crazy because I was so high on Keenan Allen last year and it ended up working out. But Mike Williams is here. Hunter Henry has arrived. And Hunter Henry, I'd, we don't have as much time to do the tight end stuff, but Hunter Henry is my buy, even though everyone knows that he's going to be the guy this year. When you look at what he has done in an efficiency basis, every bit as good as Gronk, every bit as, as good as Travis Kelsey, every bit better than Zach Ertz. And now Hunter Henry is the guy. I, I just don't see Keenan Allen coming close to wide receiver six. I'm sorry. So I like that one the best. Um, I actually disagree with the T.Y. Hilton one a little bit. I, you know, Andrew Luck, maybe he'll come back, right? <laughs> I mean, we, maybe he's going to get Who eight knows? games. Maybe he'll get 16. Maybe he'll get zero. But T.Y. Hilton is the only person on their depth chart. They don't have any wide receivers. So even if he's not very good, and I agree, I don't think he's very good without Andrew Luck. Uh, I'm just not so sure that um, he's not going to get a thousand targets. <laughs> I, I actually like both of more cells. I think they were both good ones too. T.Y. Hilton. Yeah, Andrew Luck, I'm actually like legitimately starting to get concerned. And I was one being entirely optimistic this entire time. But the fact that he still hasn't thrown a football is very, very concerning. And even if he does, does he have the, the deep ball that he used to? That was one of the best points of his game. Uh, so I definitely like that. Uh, the Juju thing, I'm everything you said, I'm on board with. I actually like Juju as a player coming into the league. Um, but I, I definitely didn't see him being a top 15 dynasty wide receiver, which is what some people view him as. I'm not quite there with him. Uh, Antonio Brown's still in town. Ben Roethlisberger is talking about retiring at some point. So there, there's a lot of ifs, ands, or buts there. So I'm with you on Juju being a potential sell high. And Le'Veon Bell's basically a really good wide receiver and a really good running back. So no, I, I'm... I'm with you. I think Juju's personality also helped to get him that high. <laughs> uh, guys, let's go to tight end. I already mentioned Hunter Henry is my buy. My sell is Evan Ingram. Um, and it's not that I don't think Evan Ingram's really good. I mean, Evan Ingram's basically a wide receiver. But the thing is, they've got Beckham coming back. They've got Shepard coming back. And Eli Manning still sucks. They don't have a running back uh, to keep defenses honest. Their offensive line is shoddy. They might help it in the, in the draft. Not at pick number two, though. I don't know what they're going to do with Evan Ingram, but he's not getting anywhere near as much attention this year as he did last year. Yeah, Evan Ingram was the on my sell list as well. Going as the number three tight end, you better be a game changer. And I, I believe Evan Ingram is a solid player, but I also he's believe... He's not Hunter Henry. I, well, that's the thing. I would have, I would rather have Hunter Henry as well, and I actually feel like all those targets missing last year, Brandon Marshall, Odell Beckham, Sterling Shepard for periods of time, I feel like all that contributed to Evan Ingram finishing the way he did. Again, he's a solid player, don't get me wrong, but... Um, Austin Hooper was another one that was on my sell list. I feel like we would have seen flashes uh, as, as some player. And some people still believe in this kid. They think it's just going to take some time. We haven't seen flashes at all. The flashes that I've seen have been actually bad. Uh, and then my two buys at tight end, 
are Trey Burton and George Kittle. Uh, you're tying them to franchise quarterbacks. Trey Burton, I've talked about him on the show. Don't need to get into that. Uh, but George Kittle tied to Jimmy Garoppolo, unless they draft a tight end, which I've been told is a possibility. But I think George Kittle looked solid enough. Um, so those are my two buys. Tonight. You think that Carson Wentz is a, is a franchise quarterback? I mean, they've got Nick Foles, man. <laughs> Super Bowl MVP. Let's not forget. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. And uh, everyone who's a Philadelphia sports fan will remind you of that every chance that they get, <laughs> which is fine. He deserves it. They deserve it. <laughs> All right. What, where do you stand on tight ends, Michael? You know, for my cell, um, and again, this is another guy that seems to be fairly polarizing, but I still am not on board with Tyler Eifert. Uh, again, it's the injury thing. I need to see him play uh, for an extended amount of time before I'm ranking him, where I'm seeing him ranked. I mean, it seems like there's people are still ranking him as if nothing happened or his injuries have been minor, right? I mean, I don't, I don't understand it. And again, he just can't stay healthy. When he's on, he's on. Don't get me wrong. He's super efficient, especially in the red zone. But I just don't – I can't trust it. And he's had some fairly significant injuries. These are not – you know, uh, arm injuries. These are not, oh, you know, he bruised something. I mean, he had an ankle injury that was pretty serious that knocked him out for, I think, damn near a whole season. So, yeah, I, I don't understand the ranking on that. As far as my buy goes, and I'm probably in the minority here, but, like, have people forgotten about Cameron Brait and, like, how he, good he's been, at least for fantasy purposes? I mean, with Jameis Winston, Winston loves him. He does. When Jameis Winston was on the field last year – Cameron Brait was a top five fantasy tight end. He completely dropped off the map when Winston was hurt, I grant you. But look, as long as Winston's there, Brait is going to see his. And look, they re-signed him so, to a fairly sizable deal this year, which don't get me wrong, I didn't get it. It doesn't make sense. especially it was a massive drafted, deal. Right. When you, when you drafted Howard with your first round pick last year, surely the thinking was, oh, Howard will take over and that'll be that. But for whatever reason, they re-signed him. So as long as they have serious money tied up in him, uh, and as long as Winston is the quarterback, I view him as, a, as at least a tight end one. I like it. I like that a lot. I don't think many people are going to agree with that, but I love it. Because Jameis, they need to trade O.J. Howard because Cameron Braid is there to stay. Uh, I don't, it, again, it was, it was weird at the time they drafted Howard, and it's even more weird now that Braid's not going anywhere. You know? There was rumors of a trade, P.S. Um, someone was telling me that there was rumors of a trade between uh, Tampa Bay, like trading away O.J. Howard or Cameron Braid. Uh, I, I can't say I'd be shocked because that, that, it really made no sense to me when they did it. And I thought maybe it was a sign-in trade deal. Uh, but someone out of Tampa that's been like listening to beat writers it was telling me that uh, Tampa's been let down by O.J. Howard's work ethic. I mean, I hadn't heard much about it, and I'm just – this is strictly a rumor, so I don't know much about it. Uh, but if that's the case, it would make more sense. Uh, and Adam Schefter has been on record as saying that we should expect a ton of trades around uh, the NFL draft, and we've already seen a record number of trades. So I wouldn't put any of this off the board. I like it. It's interesting. Uh, by the way, Tags, who plays the next game? Andrew Luck or Tyler Eifert or neither? <laughs> well, Tyler Eifert, and I wanted to comment on that one real quick. <laughs> Tyler Eifert, the reason that more I, – I, I'm totally on board with that – he was a free agent for weeks and nobody wanted him. He took a one year deal to go back to Cincinnati. It kind of tells you where the league's at on him. And uh, if he doesn't stay on the field this year, he, his career might be over. Yep, I agree. I do not have him as a tight end one in redraft leagues, let alone dynasty leagues. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, let's close out with quarterbacks here. Again, I'm going to go really quick. Uh, Kirk Cousins, he moves from a bad situation with Josh Doxson as his number one to a very good situation with Dalvin Cook, Kyle Rudolph, Stefan Diggs, Adam Thielen. And then Dak Prescott, and we talked about it last show, Tags. Uh, this offensive line is going to be healthier, um, and Dak Prescott is going to be I, – I don't think he's going to be as good as he was his rookie year, but he's a lot better than he showed last year. I think you can get him for, uh, for cheap. I think he's a QB1. I think he's a QB6 or 7. I, I think I'd rather have him in dynasty leagues than Deshaun Watson, who's one of my cells. And I know people are going to say that's crazy, but Watson is not getting – half of his touchdown rate this year he's not he's going to regress so much and he's coming off a big injury Watson is easily my number one sell in all of dynasty yeah. and Wentz it, is number two it's not even close I'm, I'm not gonna have any shares at all of either of them well I I mean and it's not to say I can't be wrong here but people are putting him as high as the number one dynasty quarterback and I think it's not I, I mean I, I legitimately think it's not guys we saw essentially what was a six game sample. If you don't count the first week where he came in, he looked bad in, in relief of Tom Savage. We, we saw six games. And if you go back and look at those games, a lot of those opponents were not that good. And I, I remember the, the marquee game that everybody kept referencing was Seattle. And if, if we go back and look at Seattle last year, Seattle was not that good. 
Like, that was Seattle's, the start of when their their secondary was crushed. Yeah, well, that, that's the thing. There were injuries. I'm not going to sit here and pretend they're not, but that was like the thing. It was like he went into Seattle and he did this. He's the guy. I'm not saying Deshaun Watson's not going to be good. I have my concerns. I had concerns when he came into the league, but my issue is considering him an elite quarterback and taking him over guys like Russell Wilson. Like what? Watch the tape. He was throwing prayers out there, half of his touchdowns. Well, I actually, one of the things, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but basically because you said that I'm going to, um, I was going through some quarterback velocity numbers from like the, from combines back all the way to 2008. And Deshaun Watson threw 45 miles per hour. Um, There was not a single quarterback that threw less than 49 uh, outside of him. So his arm strength is extremely bad. So to know that the deep ball was working last year, that might be an anomaly. Like we might see some serious, serious regression. We already knew that there was going to be touchdown regression, but his arm, and it's the thing, I'm not putting everything into miles per hour because Josh Allen throws, he set the record 62 miles an hour. I'm not going to, I'm not putting all that into one basket, but I'm saying you never want to be the worst at something and knowing his arm has limitations, knowing he's coming off an ACL surgery for a quarterback that that's going to be relied upon to put, uh, you know, put up rushing numbers. That's all, that's all concerning. So and their offensive line needs help. It's not a good, it's not a good situation. This is not a QB one situation in dynasty. <laughs> if you want to sell me a him as a QB one in dynasty, that's fine, but don't sell him to me as a top five dynasty quarterback. Well, and, and to, to, to add on to that, Mike, we're about to see a flood of quarterbacks enter the dynasty pool, right? And, and look, not all of them are going to hit, mind you, but their value is going to be pretty high for at least a couple years to see if they pan out. So I agree. I think, I think we're going to see a sort of leveling of the playing field when it comes to our quarterbacks, especially when you consider most dynasty leagues are only one quarterback leagues, right? So you don't need a, you know, unless you've got Aaron Rodgers, it's pretty much all the same after that. <laughs> I agree. That's how I feel about Aaron Rodgers and Russell Wilson. I think Carson Wentz is close to that conversation for me, but those three – and Wentz, it's still a very small sample size with him. So Rodgers and Wilson are the clear top two. And after that, it's kind of open. But, again, I, I – no. I mean, okay, I, I need to say this up front. I do not like Blake Bortles. I was furious when the what? Jags re-signed him. I don't like him. <laughs> okay, he's not good. But if we're taking small sample sizes and saying, like – Oh, he's the greatest quarterback ever. Blake Bortles was the QB one for a six game sample size. It just didn't happen at the start of the season. Like, <laughs> are we really going to just say Deshaun Watson is the QB one after six games? No. People. Bring the fire, Bobby. Blake Bortles. Uh, all right, Michael, <laughs> who, are your, uh, who are your QB buys and sells? For my sell, and again, this, this probably shouldn't be uh, a big surprise, but I've got Drew Brees there, um, you know, which I was kind of surprised he was still getting ranked fairly high. I know. Uh, our PFF rankers had him 15th. I personally had him 22nd, I think. I think you guys were probably a little more in line with what I was uh, as far as his ranking goes. But, you know, I mean, obviously the age uh, is a concern in dynasty leagues, but the fact that they truly did a shift towards the running game last year, or at the very least didn't pass as much, that's a fact, makes Breeze to me just a normal, if you want to call it that, low-end quarterback one slash two, which couple that with his age, he's nothing special to me, right? Like, if they were still the days where he was passing for 5,000 yards and had 700 pass attempts, okay, then you can make an argument that he's still got some value there. But if he's just going to be, you know, a quasi-game manager there in New Orleans, he'd still be very good and obviously very good in real life, but I'm not ready to pay the kind of price that I think people are, are willing to pay as far as dynasty startups go. I think his touchdown rate goes up, but like, is he any different than Kirk Cousins or Matthew Stafford? I, I don't think so. And you only have him for one or two years. So right. yeah, right. I agree. Yep. Uh, and uh, one, one player. So more one player. Would you take, would you take Baker Mayfield over him? Yes. Me Same. Too. Yeah. That's what I, I wanted to say. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, my rookies just as a quick side, I pretty much like all the top guys except Josh Allen. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, I saw a tweet that I absolutely loved, um, you know, a lot of people that I uh, that I respect have Baker Mayfield as their number one. A lot of people I respect have Darnold as the number one. A lot of people I respect have Rosen as the number one. And only the Browns have Allen as the number <laughs> one. That was such a funny tweet. I wish I remembered he said it so I could give him credit. But, yeah, that's a good one. Um, you know, we did a Dynasty startup mock draft, and Drew Brees wasn't even taken. So I think the experts are in our boat. Uh, I don't think the general public is quite there yet, though. No, and look, what happens a lot is people pay for the production, right? They, and they're paying for recency bias going, oh, he, you know, threw for so many touchdowns two years ago. Well, yeah, but that was two years ago. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, more. Who's your buy at quarterback? 
probably also in the minority here, so don't don't at me. But um, I'm still liking Ryan Tannehill, at least compared to where he's being taken right now. Uh, and not to say he's he's going to be a quarterback one anytime soon, but uh, before the injury last year, he was actually uh, on a pretty good upward swing as far as production goes. Uh, his last full season, he was averaging 7.7 yards an attempt completing 67% of his passes. He was throwing 20-something touchdowns for three or four years in a row, which, I mean, we talked about Matt Ryan before. Matt Ryan has only thrown 30 touchdowns twice in his career. The rest of the time, it's been 20-something touchdowns. So, to me, those two guys aren't that far off. The difference is you've got a guy in Tannehill who's always been in an offense that isn't pass first, right? They don't pass it a lot with Tannehill and the Dolphins. So, but that doesn't mean Tannehill can't be good and can't be a good fantasy quarterback. Like, for example, right now, I think our PFF rankers have him ranked as 30 as far as quarterback go, which to me, that's, in, that's insane. And look, I understand the Dolphins are looking at quarterbacks, and I get it. But to me, Tannehill can still find a starting job in this league somewhere, especially when you consider some of the other guys that teams are going with. And wherever he goes, I think he could be pretty decent. And look, Again, this doesn't do anything in quarterback one leagues, and one quarterback leagues, I should say. I don't think he's going to unseat anyone there. But if you're in a two-quarterback league, I love Tannehill as kind of a lower-end quarterback, too, that you could probably get for super cheap. He might be on the waiver wire in one quarterback leagues, honestly, in Dynasty. Uh, I think that the re the reason that some people would be ranking him as low as uh, some of the guys at PFF, I think, is because they believe that there's going to be a quarterback drafted. And, and if, if a quarterback is drafted there, that obviously takes away some things. I mean, two season-ending injuries, that's never a good thing. So he's essentially been out of football for, you know, almost two years, well, a year and a half, I should say. So that's the concern with him. He was on his trajectory. You were, you were spot on with that. I think a lot of people miss that. But I'm also to the point where it's like if you're out of football this long, it's really concerning. And on top of that, their offensive line is just so bad. I, I, their I just whole think team. I mean, yeah, they're I tanking. The this. Dolphins, yeah. The Dolphins are just in a bad place as a franchise. And I think it's going to ultimately fall on his head where it's like they're going to have to go elsewhere. So that's the only reason I would go against that. Um, I don't I, think they're drafting quarterback, though, Tags, because I, I think that they, you know, they can sit there and they can get the number four quarterback or they can tank this year which they're doing they cut all of their good players right and then they can get the number one pick next year maybe maybe number three pick and there's going to be some quarterbacks in that draft class as well so I think they're going to give Tannehill one year to prove himself maybe it works really well but I don't think they're draft I don't think Mayfield's falling to them or anything like that no no I actually think that there's going to be five quarterbacks by the time off the board by the time it gets to them if at least four like that's minimum I'm pretty sure um but yeah no my my buy right now in the, I think it's important to to mention while we're talking about quarterbacks is that we're talking about one quarterback leagues when you're trading for a quarterback don't trade for a top end one people are just going to want too much they want too much for for guys like Russell Wilson like Aaron Rodgers don't do that I'm talking about players that you're looking for that could potentially be QB ones that you're getting for cheap and I mentioned Baker Mayfield already he's like number one he's uh, going as 22nd, the 22nd quarterback off the board right now. I'd take him well before that. And then Mitch Trubisky, obviously, you know, uh, people tell me about my homerism with the Bears, but in reality, Mitch Trubisky is a very mobile quarterback. He's got sneaky athleticism where he's going to get rushing totals, and they just surrounded him with great pass catchers. Uh, Trey Burton, Allen Robinson, Matt Nagy, the offense. Like, this legitimately could be the Rams 2.0. So if you, if you could have gotten, well, Shaheen, if you could have gotten Trubi uh, Jared Goff, as like, you know, the QB 22, 23 last year, last off season, which was where he was at people right now. He's the QB nine. That's what I'm saying. Like when you're trading for a quarterback, shoot for the ceiling. Like I, I would have had no problems trading for Patrick Mahomes, but he's already going inside the top 12. So that's why I'm saying the hype is out of control with Patrick Mahomes. So that's, that's why he's not in my buy, even though I do have higher hopes for him. Well, and on that point, Mike, about one quarterback leagues, I just inherited a dynasty team. And my three quarterbacks are Drew Brees, Matt Stafford, and Pat Mahomes. So you'd think, oh, I need to trade one of those. I wish I could. Every other team has at least two quarterback one level quarterbacks that it makes it pointless. I mean, there's no, there's no reason to trade any uh, of those guys away. And there's no reason for anyone to trade for them. So, yeah, quarterbacks are just a, a funny thing, man, especially when it comes to dynasty stuff. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, that's all for today's show. Michael, we really appreciate you coming on. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, I appreciate it.
And for those of you listening at home, we have more episodes coming up. Make sure you don't miss them. We're going to be talking about the draft a lot more as it comes up. I'm doing a special mock draft episode that I'm really excited about. Uh, you can subscribe to us on iTunes so you don't miss any episodes. Just look for the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. Leave us a rating and review while you're at it. If you don't mind, it takes a few seconds. helps out the show. And if you want 25% off your first order at rxbar.com, go to rxbar.com slash fantasypros and enter promo code fantasypros at checkout. Thank you to rxbar for sponsoring today's show. For Mike Dagliere, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening and enjoy your football. I just wanted you to watch me dissolve.